The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same-game parlays. Find bets in the new Explore tab. Make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays, and more. So, visit FanDuel.com slash 247 and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Must be 21 plus and present in Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, permitted parishes only, Massachusetts, Maryland, Michigan, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, or Wyoming. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text Next Step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland. Visit 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia or call one 800 522 4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York or visit oasas.ny.gov slash gambling. Standard text messaging rates apply. Sports betting is void in Georgia, Hawaii, Utah, and other states where prohibited. My days working and taking care of my little ones can be a lot. I checked out care.com and it was so easy for me to find local, experienced, and background check sitters. Finding our babysitter was way more affordable than I thought. Care.com makes it super easy. Search for qualified candidates. You can view their profiles, read reviews and ratings, check their availability, send messages directly, get the help that you need. Care.com should be every person's go-to. Welcome to the Power Cat Podcast, GoPowerCat.com's Kansas State Athletics Show. Make sure you're subscribing to our show at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, from the GPC Studios, here's your host, GoPowerCat publisher, Tim Fitzgerald. Welcome to the PowerCat Questions Podcast, sponsored by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. We are back in the Brett Yormark era of GoPowerCat.com. He's taken over as commissioner of all things, of everything, including Dude and Daphne, who are wandering around the studio. <laughs> Tim Fitzgerald, Zach Carlson, Cole Carmody, Ryan Gilbert, we're in a hurry. We've got stuff to do today. Crowded schedule. Had a Zoom with Rodney Perry. Zoom didn't work for me. I was mad. Uh, what else we got? Oh, we got another Ooh. ding. What, me? Maybe it, it, it was you. That was me. I think it's me because I had it unmuted because of Zoom. What sucks? Gilbert, do you want to say it? Uh, no, don't say it. Say it, what? It had nothing to do with old people and uh, technology. <laughs> <laughs> it had nothing to do. I know what I'm doing, but Zoom just wouldn't cooperate no matter what I did. I always blame it on the computer. No, oh, it wasn't the computer. Well, this kind of might be the computer. My computer's been a pain in the butt. Speaking of pain in the butts, welcome to the podcast. We're sponsored by The Fridge. The Fridge is now uh, older. They, I missed their birthday party. If I don't put it into my phone, it doesn't exist, and I was invited to their birthday party. You know, what do you bring a, a liquor store for their, its birthday? A copy of Die Hard on VHS. Oh, that would have been perfect. God, that's why I keep Zach around right there. Oh, but get into the fridge whenever you're in town. It's at the corner of Westport and Claflin, right here in beautiful Manhattan. No word yet on when they're starting the pool project in the front parking lot. I was promised a pool so I could go get some liquor and just uh, lounge by their pool. But uh, Mike there might be a liar, but he's a good dude. Get into the fridge. 
Did, say, did you say Mike? Mike, yeah, he's one of the managers. Oh. Yeah, he. They sent out a, a tweet with a pool, like everyone's been doing at the stadium, but there was a like a nice pool in mm. their front parking lot. So get into the fridge and make sure you wear your speedo. You didn't say your catchphrase. Oh, oh, and get you some. Hey. Go get you some. I'm already tired of it. It's Here not we go. A catchphrase. You've done it once. <laughs> no, I've done it over time now, uh, including on social media. It's, it works uh, less effectively in print. It sounds really odd. Uh, Ryan Gilbert's got your questions from Wabash Station. This is what we do every week. Our VIP members ask us the questions. We answer for everyone to hear, and uh, sometimes we are really intelligent in our answers. Not very often, but we're going to work on it today. Gills, take it away. First question comes from Pelster, a new member to the site. So oh, nice. welcome Hi, to the Pelster. podcast. I think I just replied to you on the message boards, maybe. Wow. Huh, Making weird. a great first impression. Synergy. With the excitement around athletics, will we see the home football games sold out again? I think we're getting there real quick. Scattered singles for the Mizzou game. Mm-hmm. So I think that things are looking up as far as sellouts go. It's kind of like you and Cole. Scattered singles. <laughs> That was a good that, burn. That was, that a, was good a good one. burn. <laughs> yeah, I think we're getting there. I do, particularly if, uh, you know, they beat Missouri. Let's, let's just say hypothetically they're 3-0 and going to Norman and they win. Next time they come home, it'll be sold out. Don't they go on the road again after that? Thing? No, I'm pretty sure Texas they come Tech, home, right? right? Yeah. Oh, Texas Tech comes in. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think we're getting there. Uh, let's be honest here. K-State has... Um, a very loyal following. But in reality, and this has been an issue with conference realignment, the K-State fan base is not huge. It's very engaged, but it's not huge. So also being in a rural area with really the the two, quote, metro areas, Kansas City and Wichita being two hours away, it impacts things. Got a lot of fans in western Kansas, much more than two hours away. That impacts things. So it's tough to fill that stadium but that isn't a reflection on lack of engagement of the fan base. It's just a lack of population surrounding the stadium. Am I crazy for thinking that the more that K State wins, then the more pe- the more casual fans will want to come to the game? That's what we saw quite a bit back in the heyday. And I don't think there's any problem with that. But like, take Missouri for example. I feel like people are look on the schedule and say, "Oh, it's Missouri." You're going to have the casual fan who says, "I remember the days when Missouri was in the Big 12. That sounds like a really fun game to go to. I haven't been to a game in a few years. Why not go down to watch K-State play Missouri?" Well, plus you're getting Missouri fans probably coming over. Right. Yeah. So, I feel like out of all the three game non-conference games, that probably will be the one that has the closest chance to being sold out. But the other one I think would be the first game, simply because it's a night game. It's a six o'clock game, and it's the first game of the season, right? Uh, so that's kind of how I'm looking at this because I don't think the two lane game has that much appeal, especially because it's two o'clock in the afternoon. So again, we we saw that happen last year with Nevada, where it was it was it was just ungodly hot outside, and you know fans got mad at other fans. Oh, why aren't you at the game? And it's like if you were down on the field, you know that playing mm-hmm. at two o'clock in the middle of September. In Kansas is not always perfect football weather. It's miserable. I can't believe that K State continues to insist on playing yeah, games me not at night in September or play them at eleven. Yeah, you know, I, I get it. Play for at eleven television. or play at six. Don't but, play at two in the afternoon when you when you're picking it to play on ESPN Plus. Yeah, pick exactly. a better time. I agree. I agree. So, so K State. Or, or assuming you guys are with me on this, Missouri number one in attendance, South Dakota two, two lane three. Doesn't no. matter what the records are. Uh, uh, that first game though typically gets quite a few people because it's usually Labor Day. That's true. It's you can make a weekend of it, gone. and yeah, that's true. But it, I, I feel like that first kind of that family reunion game that they set out to make it, it's done well in the past, but. You know, I don't know if they'll get to that fifty thousand mark before. The Are they game. using that branding anymore? Maybe not, but that's what it's been treated I know, as, and I know. they and they put it at six o'clock at night. Like it's it's a a tradition to play a six o'clock home opener right. against a bad opponent on ESPN Plus or K State HD TV. I can't it is a wait tradition. until what happened net last season becomes normalized. We're going to open with someone tangible. And get the season started that way. I can't wait for that. I hope the program gets to that point. 
I mean, <clears throat> we make fun of Texas all the time, and they deserve every bit of it, but they're opening with Alabama. That's that's big time. They're going to get their ass kicked, but that'll be entertaining too. So I, I hope the program gets that. Uh, and plus, uh, I, I, I'm going to come in full Mardi Gras outfit for the Tulane game. I mean, if, if I can't go to New Orleans, I'm going to bring New Orleans to me. Bring your beads. Are you bringing the beads or uh, am I bringing the beads? Uh, well, someone better bring beads to give to me because I'm showing mine. Mm-hmm. That's probably a sign to move on, Ryan Gilbert. I will say real quick. Okay. Ah. Uh, real quick. <laughs> fans probably, I fear, might grow comfortable with watching from home over the last couple of years with COVID. So it's, it's a problem for all. Everything. A few big games will get sold out, but I think by and large, no. Yeah. In my I, opinion. I think you're right. I think uh, a lot of people discovered that the 60-inch, 70-inch TV in their basement without all the expenses is a pretty darn good way to see it with multiple camera angles. You get to learn about stuff that people in the stadium don't learn about. Um, you get to see replays immediately. It's it's a real concern. It's impacted more than just sports, and it has impacted sports. Uh, the Royals, with a really good move, uh, start streaming your games on a platform almost no one can get, and then they have to attend, and then they just tune out totally, which is what I've done. Um, but it's impacted movies and theater and all uh, all whole different things as we've changed our lives. Doing things in person is not popular anymore. No. Well, in part because uh, we've all come to realize that people are a-holes and it's, they don't, they're not in our house, so we just avoid them. We all hide. It's not good for society, but uh, we do do that quite a bit now. I'm, I'm curious to see any building project. You know, for example, we've talked about San Diego State's building – you know, 38,000 seat and be expanded to 55, I think it was. I think that's anytime you're getting into that 40 to 50 range of a stadium for a non mm, blue blood, I guess, you know, a Texas and Oklahoma, something that Nebraska, that the brand has made it part of the culture where you go every week, every week, every week. I mean, even losing hasn't stopped that for Nebraska, which is a compliment. I think that's a, a sweet spot, particularly if you're building a lot of suites, low seating, premium seating, corporate seating, um, and then you're playing in front of a sold-out stadium like the Bounce House in Central Florida. It's it's incredible. It's loud, but it's only 40-some thousand seats right now. They, they probably will expand it with Big 12 membership, but don't overexpand. I think building smaller, more... Uh, more manageable in building costs and also uh, more friendly to revenue streams is going to be really important moving forward. I think even if a Blue Blood wanted to build a brand new stadium, I think they'd see a 20% reduction in overall seats. I would agree. And you'd see way more premium seats. I'd agree. No more 106,000 Tiger Stadium capacity. Like I think if an SEC been. school that has a stadium that big right now, they'd build a seventy to 80,000 seat stadium. With a lot of premium seating. And that's the problem when you're retrofitting these old memorial stadiums, which, you know, would be just exactly the same as if Kansas State's Memorial Stadium had been built up and built up and built up. It's hard to retrofit all the kind of premium seating you want, while K-State, with its lower bowl, was able to do that with the west side and then everything else they've added. So it was interesting talking to Jim Wildridge and explaining the Legends Room. It's now the Shamrock Zone. And... He was like, what? And I go, yeah, it goes from basically the edge of the bowl of the football field back to, to Bramlin. She's like, what? <laughs> so it was pretty interesting. <clears throat> from KSU number one, outside of Deuce Vaughn, who is your pick to be K-State's most valuable player for 2022? Uh, Felix. Felix Andy DK. Uzama. I'm, I'm going to pick Deuce Vaughn. His, his, Did you not listen to the question? Yeah, I'm going to pick Deuce Vaughn to be the first and second best player on the team. No, I think you're it's right. A bad year then. <laughs> King it's a Felix, bad year. King Felix will will reign. Uh, but I'll say this, and um, this is upcoming uh, as we record this. But it appeared at Go Power Cat on what? To, what is today? Tuesday. It's Tuesday. Um, I think if the Cats really want to break through the ceiling and get into the upper echelon of this conference, a guy named Adrian Martinez needs to have a huge season. He needs to find himself. He can't be okay. 
He can't even, I'm going to say, he can't even just be Skylar Thompson good. He's got to take it to the next level and find a, a higher level of play on a consistent basis, and then K-State's going to win a lot of games. My answer to this question is Khalid Duke. I was Ooh. just thinking about him. And not because he's going to put up amazing statistics in the early part of the season. We looked at this um, when we put up the – we've looked at mo- – throughout half the roster now on our roster breakdowns. But I, I truly feel like Khalid Duke was not going to come back fully healthy until around conference play. That's kind of everything we've been hearing. You know, Next week we'll talk to Chris Kleiman and, and probably find out a little bit more about where he's at. But I, I really feel like if – Khalid Duke can come back and be somewhat healthy in the beginning part of conference play. And then by the time the middle part of conference play, if K-State is sitting around where they want to be, you know, that one to two loss range where you're still technically having a chance to play, you give yourself a chance to play in the Big 12 championship, he's going to elevate that defense so much because not only is he going to make Felix better, he's going to make Nate Matlack better. And he's just going to be a force on the defensive side of the ball. I, I firmly believe that, and I think that he might be the most talented player on that defense on that defense as a whole. Now, I will say this. I, I love your answer, <clears throat> but I was caught off guard in Arlington when Chris Kleiman said he's still not full speed. That's how bad the knee injury yeah. was, that he's still – getting ramped up I mean it's not like he was Adrian Martinez and by the end of spring football he was probably ready to go he's been rehabbing all summer and this will go I mean he's going to play but he's not going to be quite 100 percent probably until midseason and let alone who knows when he'll get the trust back of that leg so um, I was I was a little alarmed by that because I thought he'd be good to go at the start you realize he has this year and then two years after this if he wants to stay at K-State this, this COVID year thing is messing with me. Like I was looking at Felix's eligibility, and he's a junior, and I'm like, but hold on. He played the COVID year. He can still play that. I mean, he could technically be back for three years, three years including this year. Uh, he won't. But no. Wild. It, it just yeah. – uh, I see what they did, but the fact that you could have played, you know, in five games as a true freshman or whatever and then – you know, not burn four your red games. shirt. Four games, yeah. Well, four games you would have preserved your red shirt. Yeah. It wouldn't matter. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. I mean, play five games and you still have your red shirt and the COVID year. It's crazy. It's crazy. I think they were over generous, but that's okay. From El- Sorry, I need to stop going. <coughs> Bad habit. Yep, it is. From El Camino Cat, Adrian Call Martinez. <laughs> Martinez averaged 13 carries per game at Nebraska. How many carries will he average this season for the Cats? 110. It's every, a lot of plays. Uh, every play. He's going to run some plays for the other team. He's gonna okay, Scott some. Frost. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. Uh, I would have thought it was higher than that because I would like to know, actually, and this is one of the things I don't like about the NCAA, sacks and pressures, all that's considered a carry. In the NFL, it's not. Um, I would like to know what were actually designed quarterback runs. And I think that's the number to count on a, a little bit more because in – you know, Cole brought up some of the highlights of Adrian Martinez. We saw him under pressure a lot. And maybe it was he held the ball too long. Maybe it was something else. But we saw him under pressure a lot, making urgent throws off a of back foot quite often. And that's troubling. But, I mean, those go down as rushes in the stats. And that's not if he holds on to the ball. And that doesn't really – that's not fair. That's not, it skews quarterback run numbers horribly, which doesn't happen in the NFL. I would say it's going to be in the range of eight plus any sacks, which at Nebraska gets you to 13. Well, if you want to say design runs, I was going to go eight. Yeah, eight eight plus I anything think else. about one a series, you'll see one. I'd say a little more than rush. that. I'd say two or three per series. Hmm. And I think that number is probably – Five. That's not a little more, though. I said eight per game. You're saying, and that's basically one per series. You're saying two to three My per series. My initial thought was fifteen, which to is 20. sixteen really? yeah. to wow. twenty-four. Not with Deuce Vaughn back there, and not with the. No. Passing but you game. got Colin Klein. I think that adds probably five carries a game, maybe even upwards of ten. You bring up an interesting yeah. point. Does Colin Klein, because of his history, understand the effectiveness of the quarterback run game, or does he understand the wear and tear it takes on that's the quarterback? Bingo. That's, that's I'm on, why I don't understand. Bingo. I'm on the second side of that. I think Colin says, you need to save your body. Yes, this is effective as a play, 
but you can't just ram, ram, ram as a QB run and expect to have a quarterback at the end of the yeah, year. Yeah, there's an old, there's a saying that goes, you know, as a coach, you know, if coaches who are former players take what they have learned from their coaches, both good and bad, and use it to their advantage, right? I am on the train with you guys where, yeah, I don't I don't think Colin Klein is going to run the quarterback that much because he knows, okay, well, when I played, yeah, I, I could do it because I was big, I was strong, and quite honestly, I didn't have the best arm. But Adrian Martinez has twice the arm that Colin Klein had, and I think he understands that that is going to be Adrian Martinez's game. That's what he sold Adrian Martinez on coming to K-State was the fact that he was not going to run as much. Adrian Martinez has talked about, I'm gonna not going to run as much. I'm going to be a throwing quarterback. I want to be an NFL-style quarterback. So I don't think he's going to run that much. I'm with you, Fitz. I, I think – what we will see is if Adrian Martinez in trouble is in trouble. Instead of trying to scramble and get two, three yards, he'll just throw it away and 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 live to play another down. Which, quite honestly, I think that's a good idea. Mm-hmm. At this point, if you want to save your keep your quarterbacks healthy, do that. Because how many times did we see Skylar Thompson try and get that extra yard, and sure enough, he's taking a hit. And I felt like as the season went on last year, when Skylar Thompson was injured, he was better because he was forced to use his arm. He was forced to read the defense more, and he didn't rely so much on his athletic ability. That's what Adrian Martinez needs to do. My final point is I think Martinez is more multidimensional than Colin Klein was with this, you know, with, with his arm. Mm-hmm. So I think that being more multidimensional, I think it takes away the run and that designed run a lot more times than it would have with Colin Klein. Skylar Thompson had 48 rushing attempts last season. Or not, yeah, Skylar Thompson had 48 rushing attempts last season. Um, Does that so. include sacks? It would. That's kind of crazy. crazy, yeah. But how many games did he play? How many missed? Four? He played in one, two, three. He just missed one full game and then half of the. He played in 10 games. So that's so, okay. basically that's five crazy. rushing attempts. That doesn't seem right. But you had 11 against Stanford, seven against. Uh, Iowa State, seven against Texas Tech. And then it goes five TCU, two Kansas, three West Virginia, seven Baylor, five LSU. Seems like more than 48, but. Well, there was one mixed in there. But Played yeah. in 10 games out of 13? Mm hmm. He missed the Oklahoma State game and the Texas game. That's it. And Southern Illinois. Well, Southern Illinois. Oh, Nevada. Nevada. Or Nevada, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. My bad. I will, so you got, was it Oklahoma State that had the cheap shot on Klein? Uh huh. Colin Klein was always bruised up and, and banged up and all that stuff, and he could still fight through it. And uh-huh. that's what being a quarterback and being a football player is all about, in my opinion. I'm going to disagree with all of you and that's say fine. that yeah. they're going to pound the football. Okay. I and honestly, the if that cheap of, shot doesn't happen, the we're presence at a of Will Colin Howard Klein. might make him feel okay about it. Because I'm telling you, folks, they love Will Howard. He's I know he struggled in games. He's made us all upset at times, uh, but. They they like it the way he approaches the game, and they just need to get him settled down in game situations because he's great in practice. I mean, it's I, I feel like Will Howard is going to break through at some point. Is it at Kansas State? We don't know, but he's going to be a good quarterback. I th- it's all there. The co- the coaches know what they're saying. They're not just saying things to prop up, uh, you know, to promote a, a fake talking point. They trust Will Howard, so maybe you're right. Maybe, or maybe they put Will Howard into some of these situations since he's now six five and seven hundred and fifty pounds and of all muscle, and the kid's huge now. Gigantic. He's. It's amazing what we saw as a true freshman, hmm. and people forget that he was playing as a seventeen year old in the Big Twelve, barely eighteen, maybe. I think he was eighteen. He's twelve. He was twelve. Last question of the first half from Ghost Day Kate. The football team has only sold half their original allotment of passes to their NIL collective. I'm personally disappointed. Why would this not be a huge success? I think it's just too vague. People don't know what they're... I think it feels like you're literally just giving them money and you're not going to get really anything in return. You might get yeah. like a meet and greet somewhere, think, but you're literally just giving well, You know what? I think they would have been better off selling it that way. This is a flat-out NIL play. Mm-hmm. We're going to do some things for you, but you are literally helping fund K-State football players. It's a donation. It's a donation. They yeah. were almost better off doing it. I think the perks were vague, and I think that the perk tiers, I mean, you had to buy 10 passes, which is two grand. They're one ninety nine a piece, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you had to buy 10, 10 passes, which is two grand to get a steak dinner with the team. 
That's just not very, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I could spend $2,000 better if i wanted to go eat dinner with the team but you let's know? let's be let's let's be real here if you have two thousand dollars to give to the football program you don't care if you get to go to a steak dinner or not you you nailed it sure. right there True. and but plus you're probably already giving that money indirectly now, this was a play for the common fan and i think they'd have been better off doing hundred dollar two thousand passes and and just say what it is, folks. It's just you're basically by a thousand passes, a hundred players. You're basically giving every player two thousand dollars. I mean, that's yeah. which you know, in in light of what Texas Tech's doing is jump change, but it it's a start. It's a start. I appreciate what they're doing, but um, also this gets back to this. K Staters, K State fan base isn't a bunch of wealthy people running around and. Times are tough right now. I mean, two hundred dollars will fill up your VW Bug. I might have lied on that. I might have exaggerated, but um, yeah. I mean, is it any sort of violation to just do? Hey, you can donate a dollar. You can donate ten thousand dollars. Like having it set at well, such a high amount. I appreciate the business model that they've tried, and, and it's it'll work some places. It'll work, and part of me thinks it's a year late. Had this been a year ago with, you know, the Bitcoin boom and all this crypto, because the pass is on the blockchain. They, they've stated they're using blockchain technology. It's an NFT. You are buying an NFT for $199, and there's a 1,000 of them. It's a limited edition thing. I understand the concept they went for. You know, people were saying, oh, why would they limit it to 1,000? It's for scarcity. It, it, it's something exclusive, something that you can be a part of. I think they probably missed the mark on the price point. I think they probably missed the mark on the number of passes that they released. But I absolutely love and appreciate what they tried to do. But I think that with the way that, you know, the stock market, the economy, inflation, Bitcoin cooling off, reducing by about 50 percent, you know, it's it kind of changed in the NFT market. Because since this is an NFT, you know, I don't know how much you guys uh, understand NFTs or nope. follow the NFT market, but, you know, these top kind of blue chip NFTs from, you know, 12 months ago, nine months ago that were selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, they were six figure NFTs. Now they're five figures and coming down hard. So it's right. the whole, the whole blockchain thing. It, it's, it's cooling at this point, I think. People don't understand it. They don't trust it. Right. It's not government. It's It just feels like a scam. I'm going to sell you this thing that doesn't actually really exist, uh, and you're going to pay a whole bunch of money for it, and it's going to gain value, wink, wink. I, 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 I don't know. And plus, again, the economy right now is really tough on a lot of people, particularly if you're in business and, and trying to pay all the bills. So I, I get it. I... I don't think it's a statement on K State fans. I just think it's a statement on the moment that it was released. They would have almost been better off if this had rolled out June one, and and people, I, I guess they waited for the football season. But also, you've got a lot of expenses to worry about. It's going to cost a lot to go to games this year. I mean, just getting there. So it's, it, I, I don't know. I I, I just think. Uh, it didn't quite hit in this market the way they planned, but it also felt way too vague for me to trust. Not that I don't trust the players. It just seemed odd. Message board, though. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious, though. How are they going to moderate that message board? <laughs> Good because luck. Because if the players are going to be on it, which I don't know how much they're going to participate, but... You don't I want mean, to read that. I mean, at what point, if you're having a bad season and yeah. you paid 200 bucks? Like, we can moderate our message board. You know, there's terms and conditions that we yeah. list out, you know, that 24-7 lists out. You have to follow the rules. Can you imagine? What are their rules? Can you imagine getting mad at Deuce Vaughn for fumbling and, and then you just have a drunken fan get on the message board after the game and, at Deuce Vaughn, you suck. You mm -hmm. know, like, things like that. I mean, you'd think paying money would kind of prevent the the a hole type of fan. No, it'll but, it promotes it. Yeah, but it almost like, promotes it. I but it almost gives you, but it almost gives you a direct line more so than just being in somebody's Twitter mentions. Mm -hmm. You know, how 
And now you and you hide behind that name, your username, even more than people do on Twitter. You can potentially do that but now. they have your credit card. This is true. Mm, it's always remember that, folks. But I'm curious, like... I guess we none of us have bought it, so I'm curious how you pay for it and where where on the blockchain this thing exists. But are they are they truly making you purchase an NFT? Because if you're using crypto and a wallet, you know, technically it could be pretty anonymous. Okay, I'm confused. Me too. We will unconfuse everything after this break, but we're not going to talk about NFTs. I'm not even sure what NFT stands for. The National Football Token. Ting. Ting. Non-fungible like, token. It's like thing, but they couldn't afford the eight. Ting. Thank you, Fridge, for everything you do for humanity. GoPowerCat.com's PowerCat podcast continues after this short break. Picture this nightmare scenario. You're hosting friends for the big game. It's neck and neck in the fourth quarter, and suddenly you realize you're out of drinks. You start to sweat. Your friends start to turn on you. You're forced to go on a last-second drink run and end up missing the game-winning touchdown while in line. (whistles) Terrifying, isn't it? Luckily, you can avoid the drama with Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery. With Drizzly, you can shop a huge selection of beer, wine, and spirits, then get them delivered right to your watch party. Compare prices across multiple stores in your area, find the best deals on game day drinks, and get back to armchair quarterbacking from, you guessed it, your armchair. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com today. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. JamesAllen.com is the online destination to easily design a customized engagement ring and save up to 50% compared to traditional stores. You pick a diamond, whether it's lab created or earth created. James Allen has over 200,000 conflict free stones. Then you pick your ring setting and metal. And if you need some help, they have real time diamond consultations available where an expert can walk you through it all. Get 25% off your order at jamesallen.com code podcast. That's jamesallen.com code podcast. Welcome back to the Power Cat Podcast. Now, let's return to the GPC Studios. Welcome back to the Power Cat Questions Podcast, sponsored by Fred Wholesale Liquor, Tim Fitzgerald, Zach Carlson, Cole Carmody, and Ryan Giz Gilbert, who I think is still going to be uh, asking the questions, but it got a little confusing for my old man brain. I've had a rough morning trying to conquer Zoom technology, which shouldn't be difficult since I've used it for years now, but it was, and now here I am, and I got a lunch appointment I got to get to, and we're not going to get the overtime recorded, and I don't know when we're going to do it. I'm, I'm, this is a mess. Here we go. Ryan Gilbert. First oh, question. Hi. Thank you, Fridge. Go ahead. Fridge. <laughs> it comes from Bill Snyder Kleinsdale. Good job, going to give Gilt. me a round of applause. Wow. It's a new member. Here's a so cheerio. Welcome. Okay, give me again. What was it? Bill Snyder Kleinsdale? Yeah. Oh. What does that really mean? I don't get it. I'm too young. I don't know. Are you kidding me? It's a B- Clydesdale. Bill Snyder was a Hun. football coach. Clydesdale. You don't know what a Clydesdale is? I do not. Oh, my God. He's led such a sheltered life. Uh-huh. He's never watched the Super Bowl I, before. Can I, you I blame my that? parents. Can you believe that? That Steelers fan has never watched the Super Ooh, Bowl before. Ooh, burn. Um, actually, I'm beginning to suspect he was raised in a cult. <laughs> okay. Okay, here we uh, rank, <laughs> rank who will be an alma mater head coach first. Lori Kane, Colin Klein, Sean Snyder, Shane Southwell, Lauren Ramatowski. Lauren Ramatowski was a volleyball player, for those that are unaware. What was her maiden name? Lauren. Oh, for I don't know. Does Lori Kane not need an explanation? Because I did not know who that basketball, was. Basketball, women's basketball. Women's She's basketball. She's assistant at Washington State under Cammie Etheridge. Is she the right? Is she the? Is she the correct answer here? From a, as far as a career trajectory goes, I, I think Colin Klein's a correct answer. But to be first, I mean, Colin Klein's going to have that's going to be ten, twenty years down the line, wouldn't you think? Yeah, I think if we're if on a timeline, I think it's Lori Kane. And I know that sounds crazy to you, Gills. I, I, I appreciate that you guys think Chris Klein is going to be here ten or twenty years, but I see a couple things here that's a problem with that. <clears throat> first, my voice. Second, if he's really successful. And the NCAA does break into <clears throat> semi-pro football in college. In case it's in the college, that means the semi-pro leagues are going to be offering him three times as much as what K-State can. And as much as I appreciate and expect him to be loyal, you're not turning down $10, 12000000 million a year. 
you just can't do that to your your I mean that's generational money that changes everything especially when football is football yeah and he'll play football anywhere or he, he could what he's putting onto the field translates to the NFL and so maybe someone will come after him just like they they did it with other college coaches. So I appreciate that you guys think he's going to be here 10 or 20 years. I'm a little more pessimistic on that. Plus, on the women's side of basketball, Jeff Mitty just got a contract extension. Granted, it wasn't a 10-year extension, but that program seems to be trending in the right way. And I don't see similar issues with salary at other schools with women's basketball. What if I told you that on this list – There was a coach who is a consensus All-American. He spent time at two Power 5 schools in his playing career. He spent time as a coordinator at three different Power 5 schools in his career. Was was this person an offensive or defensive coordinator, Cole? Uh, He has spent time. He is in the school's ring of honor. And he just recently got a job as a Power 5 assistant. Would that coach sound like a candidate for a head coaching job? Were they an offensive or defensive coordinator? I'll hang up and listen. <laughs> uh, I plead the fifth. I'm with Zach. No, I, I, I don't think that. I think it actually is the right answer, Shane Southwell. I think he has a long way to go before he's even head coaching material, period. Yeah. I think there's potential there, sure. Now, let's just back up. I'm not. This is not a shot at Shane in any way because I, I love the kid and I think he's going to be a great coach. But look at the type of assistant coaches that the new coaching staff hired compared this to what true. the old coaching staff did. I mean, we're talking about guys with years and years of experience. And even Rodney Perry brings something Shane doesn't, just incredible recruiting connections, experience as a head coach, even if it was at the high school and, you know, the AAU levels, it doesn't matter. So, I, yeah. Shane, I, Shane Southwell simply has not had the Kim English trajectory of his coaching career post-playing. Mm-hmm. I, He's still very young, though. Yeah, still young, still has plenty of time. But I'd probably go Lori Kane. I might actually go Shane second on this list. I don't know about Lauren Ramatowski. I'm going to go with volleyball. And maybe like, not her, maybe someone else. Because they're building. And by the way, have you seen the size of that thing? Uh, yeah. When I just went by, drove by the steel structure going up for the volleyball arena, I'm like, oh, that is so much bigger than what I thought. Well, I think it's interesting. We walked by it, you know, at the football camp on Friday. They've She's actually an put. assistant at Washburn right now. She is? According to her LinkedIn, Ramatowski go to the, she got hired by K State this in in March. Oh, okay. She's an assistant. <laughs> Guys, I hate to be this guy, okay. but we're not even going to mention Brad Underwood. He's not on the list. But okay, Bill no. This Snyder, is Klein's this is about battle. this is about people that went to K State who will become head coaches, not necessarily at K State. No, I thought it was I here. A, an uh, alma mater head coach. Yeah. They went to K State. Uh, Which of these K Staters okay. are going to be a head coach at K State? Okay. I, no, I, I didn't read anywhere. it as that. That's how I read it. That's how I. Well, read okay. It. Well, if that's how we're going to read it, it's Colin Klein in a discussion. Okay, that's why we're so. If, <laughs> but if we're picking a head coach, Lori Kane, Shane Southwell. <laughs> Actually, I, I'm. If it's everywhere, but, I'm more convinced it's Colin Klein. I'm absolutely convinced it's Colin Klein. If it's anywhere, because if K State's offense. Looks incredible this year. He will have the opportunity to be a Mountain West coach next year, a Sun Belt coach next year, maybe even a lower Power Five. I don't, I don't know where that'd be, but I'm, I'm not sure. I, I do think that the next sport probably to be coached by an uh, alumnus of the this institution will be volleyball. They're building that new arena. Yeah. The visibility investment. And volleyball is going way up, and they just can't be okay anymore. They've got to start excelling. Um, and, you know, at some point, this is on the message board, and this is so true. If you really want K State to win a national championship, pick volleyball and set up an NIL with a big donor that is going to buy all the best players to come into Manhattan, Kansas. That is very tangible. 
I mean, when you're talking about, it used to be kind of like baseball where you had to be around a beach to have good programs. And then Nebraska proved it and Penn State's proven it. And the Big Ten now is at somehow the most powerful volleyball conference. That tells me it's very possible for Kansas State with a strong NIL program to load that program with top recruits. That would be my plan because I love volleyball. But, yeah, let's move on. From I Like Pickles Cat, do you think K-State will try to make their out-of-conference schedule harder by trying to schedule the top three teams in a power conference rather than middle to bottom tier teams like they have recently or not playing any more FCS teams? Or will they just rely on the new Big 12 for their better opponents and keep the same philosophy? Well, the the issue is they're not intentionally scheduling lower teams. Rutgers might have been. But you schedule store in advance, there's no way to know what they'll be. I mean, they've got Arizona coming up, which is ironic. They might lose that and have to scramble around and get another non-conference game because that might be a conference game by then. Colorado, too. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll get into that in the next okay. question. Uh, but it, I think you can schedule the teams that want to schedule you. So does... Let's help me out here. Uh, Oregon want to play K State. Does Florida want to play K State? No, they don't. The, because K State's in that position to where they're usually in the middle to upper half of the conference, and so a look from Florida losing to K State looks bad for Florida. If K State loses to Florida in the non-conference, it doesn't look bad. It's like Texas and Alabama. Sure, based off of names alone. I guess you could say that Alabama losing I mean, to Texas. Florida's look playing bad, Utah this year. That's that's a good season opener. It is. It like, is. And, but, I th- and I would I would say K State and Utah are probably pretty similar in in the realms they come from as far as where an, what an opponent is. That's who you have to play. You got to play Utah. You got to play Missouri. I've been on this train. You got to play Nebraska. Like these are the types of schools that you need to play. Yeah. So to answer Pickle's question, I mean, I think K State should try and get the middle tier of those teams because those are the teams like you said fits that are going to want to play you but even with the new teams i like the format of you play one fcs or group of five bad group of five team and then you have one power five opponent and then you have a team like nevada you have a team like tulane who's in a, a non non-power conference that you can beat but maybe we'll test you a little bit i think that's a good formula and again i think it's very doable I'd just rather not play paid games. Just go do a home. And if you're going to play a bad team, you know, go play at the Sun Belt place. Go play at Louisiana Lafayette. Don't if you're going to go and, and play if they're going to if you're going to bring them in to play you at home and you're going to play a road non-conference game every other year. Why not go play at Tulane? Go play at these places like that. So you're not. You know, spending I, Tulane being a, a two for one, I believe, probably means that there is some money exchanged there. But lessen your cost of of paying people. You shouldn't be paying South Dakota mm-hmm. to come to Manhattan and, and fund their f- football program for a year. I get that FCS survives on those games. I get that Coach Kleiman respects the FCS game and playing those teams. But from an athletic department standpoint and a K-State standpoint, I don't want to see it like that. Go play, go play you North should, Dakota State. Yeah. You, sh- <laughs> you shouldn't be playing. You shouldn't be paying millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars to have an opponent show up on a Saturday. I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of playing FCS programs. I just am. I wish the practice would end. I understand the scheduling nuances get very difficult in those buy games full slots if the big 12 keeps expanding 16 is very manageable nine games but 20 all of these conferences are going to face some issues with that we got something coming up on that okay so let's move just ask it king jim 77 asks what's your ideal scheduling system if the big 12 adds the four corner schools how would divisions or pods work People we, get, can go, we can go 16, then 20. Yeah, let's do 16. People get so confused with pods. The average fan won't know who's in what pod. I mean, the, the diehards will. I mean, in this scenario at 16, if you, if you add four teams from the pack, that gives you five out west. And probably that means Colorado then participates in a pod with Kansas State, Kansas, and Iowa State. That would be geographically if you wanted to do it that way. Maybe you do 
something different, but that's how it breaks. You break out in four pods of four. So you're going to play those three teams within your geographical footprint every year. Three games right there. So there's now three other pods of four, right? Um, and you will essentially play two teams from each of those pods every year on a rotating basis. So that gets you to nine. But you can also do it this way. You can also schedule one of those teams as an annual opponent. So, for example, Iowa State, West Virginia have a little something going on. They're going to play every year out of the, when those two pods overlap. Kansas State, TCU, they're going to play every year because they got something going on. You wouldn't think Oklahoma State? Um, that's a good point. Um, no, that is a really good point. In this scenario, Oklahoma State's in the Texas pod and Houston's in the Eastern pod just because they lose the bet. I mean, you could move Iowa State to the Eastern pod, but then they lose all their ties to the Big 8, Big 12, which is odd. Um, other than West Virginia, which then they were in a pod with. But um, they're also in a pod with Central Florida, which makes no sense. Here's how I'd do it. I'd pod by region and rivals and common opponents and schedule it NFL style. So you have your four pods, then you play those three three teams in your pod, play one other pod, all four teams. Mm, that's what and I was And then like. the other two pods – Based on the finish last year, you play – if you finished first in your pod, you play the two first-place teams in those pods. You play the second, it. third, fourth, and you get nine games perfectly that way if you have 16 teams. That's a good way to do it. So you'd, you wouldn't necessarily play everybody every other year, but you'd in, – in a four-year – in a three-year period, you'd play every team once. What, what I like about having an annual opponent out of each pod is you have six games that are kind of constant. And then based every two years, then you're rotating the other three games through and you will see all 16 teams in your conference in a six year period. You'll play everyone at least twice in a six year period. Now, contrast that to what the SEC has gone through with a 14 team conference in which they've had traditional rivals not play each other in 10 years. I don't know what they were thinking when they set that conference up. 14 is a horrible number, but 16 is very manageable. No, you don't want two divisions of eight. First of all, then you got a division. And second of all, you'll play seven teams every year. Everyone will play those same teams. The divisions can get out of whack, which we saw in the Big 12. We see it in the SEC. We see it in the Big 10. It happens. You get your divisions out of whack, and then one division's a lot better, and you're playing a much tougher schedule. And if you're really going to get away from playing division champions and just play the top two teams, you need a little bit more balance and a little more randomized schedules. So I see that. 20 gets more difficult because then you're looking at probably – Five pods of four or four pods of five, and the math gets more difficult. At that point, the question becomes, it actually works to play 10 conference games. Now, is that something the TV partners would want if you played 10 conference games and also said, we're done playing FCS? So you no longer have to worry about a crappy FCS game being played. You'll have fewer games in your inventory because there's more conference games but those will be higher quality games. So that's the that's the question you you need to answer. I see it as having more games in your inventory because they're more quality. Wouldn't and, TV love that? Yeah, I feel like TV would love that. Because well, the, the games that you're losing are those games right. from from ESPN Plus or right. wherever you're putting you're them. You're basically really dumping matter. your Tier 3 yeah. football, and everything's Tier 1 and 2 at that point, which is a good way to go. So. Uh, I think nine's the appropriate number of games. I think any conference trying to schedule eight conference games is cowardly. I know what they're trying to do. <coughs> SEC. I know, it's so obvious what they're trying to do, and it's sickening that the national media lets them get away with it by somehow celebrating and not shaming those November FCS games. Because you have Kentucky, who's uh, at the time, there'll be, what, five and six or four and six, and they play James Madison in the second to last game right. of the season, and then they, they in the year at Vanderbilt. Game. Yeah, they could lose that. Okay, yeah, but, but they still have a chance to get bowl eligible. Right, right. It, I mean, honestly, it, That's all that it, it does. helps. It helps. I mean, if you're going to play four non-conference games in West Virginia up and play two power five opponents, I'm all in. I do think there should be a part of the formula for the playoff system should be the number of power five opponents you play because only playing 
nine with eight conference games and one that that cheapens your schedule and i don't care if you're alabama or georgia it go play people and if i'm a tv partner i'm like will you schedule better games because i don't care if it is alabama if they're playing georgia southern which is now F- fbs but if you're playing one of those games they've typically played it it can't get the kind of ratings that you want so it's it's going to be very intriguing. 24 is an impossible number. You're just not going to see teams in your conference very often. And at that point, you better be playing 10 conference games just for that reason. And it's still hard to come to that number and, and schedule equitable across the board. It, it's very, I'm, I'm really caught up in the math and the pods and all that. But I'm, I'm telling you this, folks. Anyone who says the word divisions around me might get punched. Because divisions have been the downfall of conferences. They've been, they make some feel like outsiders. They literally divide your conference, us against them. Pods don't do that because they don't appear in standings anywhere. All, it's all behind the scenes. They're scheduling pods. They're nothing more than that. They're nothing to do with the standings or anything. It just guarantees that Kansas State, you will see traditional big eight rivals every season home and away. And I love that. I want, final thing, I want a pod of K-State, Iowa State, KU, and Oklahoma State. That's what I request K-State's pod to be. Uh, what was it again, Colorado? No. No Colorado. Iowa State, K-State, KU, Oklahoma State. I think that's perfect for K-State. Well, adding five teams out west in a 16-team conference becomes an issue with scheduling, no matter how you look yeah. at it. I mean, even if you want to do divisions, well, who are you going to send west? You're going to... Oklahoma State, Tech, and K-State, you're going to literally rip them away from everyone else that they've scheduled with. Well, fits. And, and another issue is, do you create a Texas pod? Because Texas recruiting is so important to all of us. Do you create a pod in which everyone goes different directions? So you're always playing in Texas. I'm not, I'm not sure how they're going to do it. And they'll come up with the appropriate way to do it. But if they, if they say the word divisions, uh, i we're going to have an issue. I'm, I'm going to lose my shh. I don't have to put that on. I think. Along the same lines, uh, last question from Wyatt Bowlinger, 15. Rather than taking four programs from the Pac-12, would it be more beneficial to add three Western schools, Arizona, Arizona Bingo. State, and Utah, for example, to make a quad with BYU, then add one Eastern school, Memphis, for example, to make a quad with UCF, West Virginia, and Cincinnati. I think that's the right solution. The problem with it is there's nobody that presents themselves that is that you want to invite in. South Florida has missed an incredible opportunity here. They have squandered a, a an opportunity to change their entire institution by not better preparing with an on-campus stadium, a better emphasis on sports, buying in like UCF has done, they're going to get left behind. When the Big 12 is basically begging them to do things right so that they can add that rivalry and have a second floor to school. I, Memphis, I, I don't think really addresses the problem because they're closer to the Big 12 footprint than than the schools we're talking about i mean honestly if you, if you go to 20 teams hopefully you'll have ucf in a pod with acc teams and you know the, the northern east coast pod because i mean central florida is just almost as far away from morgantown as ames iowa <laughs> so it, it doesn't really make sense but I, go ahead. i have a school out of left field that i don't know if we've ever mentioned on this podcast but I think that it could – maybe it's realistic, maybe it's not, but I'm just going to say it. Okay. I think it's very outside thinking, out of the box. Is okay. it Wake Forest? It is not Wake Forest. Oh. You talk about promoting a school and maybe jumping to the f- Power Five is too much. But if you want to be on the forefront of some things, would you ever consider Jackson State? No. Yeah, there's a reason it's never been mentioned on the podcast, Cole. Yeah, I, I see and what I after. say this <laughs> with all sincerity because well, there there's no HBCUs that are Power Five. Well, uh, a reason because there's smaller institutions that don't have huge donor bases, alumni bases. And I understand that. 10,000 enrollments to 10,000 student enrollments. They are efforting to, to break that stereotype. 
um, and and get into the FBS. And they have a sixty thousand capacity football stadium, which is crazy. Yeah, where do they play? They play at Mississippi Veterans Memorial Stadium. Okay. And again, I, I, I like I said, I don't think that that's necessarily a realistic possibility, but I, it is intriguing. In fifteen, I mean, to, TCU's enrollment's what twelve? Not a lot. What's that? Who's enrollment? TCU. Yeah, but it's all wealthy Texans. Yeah. True. I just think if you have a school that would make that jump, Jackson State would be the one that would do it. And if we think that Brett Yormark is this person who is outside of the box thinking, if there's any conference that would add a school like Jackson State, and again, I'm not is, necessarily well, just saying is it. Is Deion Sanders on a lifetime contract? Because go. I think that that's the, the key to to Jackson State, right? I agree. So it's it's so you Deion up, Sanders, you. You bring up Brett Yormark, and, and here's the question. Will he view a school such as that of having the potential engagement of a long, of a of a wide area like i've made the argument san diego state could grow into that and i feel the same way about if south florida get their crap together maybe they could does he view it that way and and honestly if you moved a a historically black college into the power five would that become the the notre dame of african americans they might just tend to start rooting for them it's an interesting concept or would their loyalty still lie with their alma mater which is you know maybe another hbc i think an, i think a school like jackson state if they ever were to jump to the fbs level and were playing in a power five conference to where they were on tv that there that there would be a substantial boost just because it's an interesting story just because it is something that you know it, it's it's different it's unique and a school like that that has so much history there's people that would look at that and say I'm going to tune in because I want to see how this goes. And you want to talk about talent. I mean, Jackson State has started to get some serious talent with Deion Sanders. Again, now I'm with you. This would have to be something where you'd go to Deion and be like, hey, we want to do this. But part of the reason we want to do this, if not the only reason we want to do this, is because of your football program. Now does he say, okay, then I'm going to stay. Or does he say, all right, well, he's going to be in there for a year and then leave. It's, Again, it's fascinating. I think it would take – to move any FCS school, and I'm including the FCS schools in the last 10 years that have moved up, it's going to take hundreds of millions of dollars to move up. I mean, Liberty is probably the closest example of, of moving up divisions or moving up from FCS to, to FBS. And that's a private Christian university with a ton of money. And they aren't necessarily successful at this point. It would take so much money to to move an FCS school of any stature to try moving them into the Power Five of all places with with no stops on the way up the ladder. It's it's a huge jump, and and well, I appreciate I, the boldness, and I don't I, think no, it's a terrible I'm, idea. I'm getting more intrigued by it because now I'm thinking, does this encourage people such as Jay Z and Oprah? To say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna get involved in this and 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 provide some of that funding. I, it, I it's I thought you were crazy, but now you're kind of and the, and the basketball coach at Jackson State is Mo Williams right now. Mo Williams played for the Cleveland Cavaliers mm-hmm. with LeBron, another one of those former athletes that probably is going to be able to recruit at a fairly high level. Again, if there is a school that yeah, is able, if there's to a do school, it, sure, it is Jackson State. I just think uh, right now, at this point, if you're the Big 12, just general expansion, if you're considering Eastern Group of Five schools, I think that you need to wait. I think it's silly. I think that the ACC is going to come undone at some point, and I think that there's plenty of schools in the ACC that's exactly it. that would join the Big 12. And, and even if – let's say that the Pac-12 – sorts their stuff out over the next year or two and gets a new grant of rights. And I think right now they're looking at a similar five to six year deal, kind of like what the, the big 12 is probably going to do with their next media rights. If all those schools decide to stay and if Washington and Oregon are just going to hang out in the PAC 12 for another five years, the ACC could very well become the, the new target right. of the SEC. I mean, it's not that they aren't a target. They are certainly a target right now. But they probably become a little more attainable over the next few years. You know, if Clemson jumps ship, if North Carolina and Duke, if oh, they go to Notre Dame, if Notre Dame, if you Notre know, Dame goes to the Big Ten, the ACC is in big trouble. Yeah, the if the ACC splits up, the, I think there's a lot more viable schools for the Big Twelve than maybe even 
the Utahs, the Arizona States, the Arizonas of the world out west. And then, but then the issue is you leave BYU out on a, on an island. Yeah, and, and well. that's that's probably why the Big Twelve and the media that covers them and the fan base is so intrigued uh, by the Pac-12. Is it gives BYU a place to play and gives them some some branches out on the tree. I'm I'm fascinated by what's going to come out of all of this, but I would love to sit down with Brett Yormark and and figure out how he's measuring future worth. So he he's now talking about um, bandwidth when he's talking about institutions. Any time a reporter such as Stuart Mandel or those clowns out in the the Pac-12 who are now started their own podcast, the Goofy and Dopey Show, whatever, Kuzano and well, I don't even know their names, Wilner, uh, the, the biggest Homer reporters I've ever seen. Um, anytime they start saying the word market, market, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Markets don't matter nearly as much, and they won't matter. They'll matter even less as we move into the future. I mean, markets were solely based on ESPN's carriage rights and, and being able to force people to pay for ESPN that didn't want ESPN. It was, it was basically a hostage situation. And now as people cut the cord, we're seeing the non-football, non-sports people say, I don't, I'm going to join a platform where I don't have to pay for that. Maybe it's Philo or something that doesn't have sports on it. They, they, just, they, they don't want it. Why should they pay for it? I mean, why do I have to pay for kids' programming when I don't have kids? That I know of. Why should I have to pay for that? I just always, I always need to make that asterisk. Maybe Becky has some children she doesn't know about. We don't know. We don't know how this works. We could never figure out how to have children, so how do we know? Anyhow, um, and there's a play now coming up on the East Coast that we're not talking about so much here of ACC expansion, and they're eyeing Cincinnati and West Virginia. So... There's a lot of moving parts here. If I'm Brett Yormark, I go get San Diego State. It clips the Pac-12 right at the knees. Because you could sell them, look, I know you probably want to be in a conference with other West teams, and you will be eventually with a bunch of them. But if you join them now, you're going to go through this in a few years and probably get left out. If you join us now, you're not going to get left out. I'm surprised nobody's mentioning Colorado State to the Pac-12. It, it, it baffles me because it's got to be Colorado saying no because they look down on them so much. But in, in they reality— They a brand-new stadium. Them and, and San Diego State are the same two schools at this point that you can add. Less success at Colorado State, but again, people get so caught up in the success at the moment. I mean, they're all raving about the additions the Big 12 had because they were all really successful. It's the top three teams in the American and BYU, which is always traditionally pretty damn good and would have been Pac-12 champions last year. Look, I get that. But where are they going to be in the future with Big 12 money? People never stop and ask that. Where will this university be if elevated to this platform? And just because some AD made a bad hire or two at a football coach doesn't mean the whole institution isn't worth more. I think Colorado State finally got it right with Norville. I think that was a good hire. Um, and, and an interesting hire moving within their own conference. That must mean Colorado State thinks they, they can get up, climb up. And again, I come back to this. Colorado does not bring you the, quote, Denver market. Nobody in Denver, I say nobody, very few in Denver give two craps about Colorado athletics. They have a fan base, yes, but it doesn't bring you the market. I would venture to say Colorado State in the Big 12 would eventually surpass Colorado, in, and not eventually in 30 years, like in five years, and for fan engagement, for fan interaction. I would love to know how Brett Yormark is measuring this, because it is the most important thing here as we move closer and closer to more streaming. And folks... You're all worried about how many games will be on the networks. Eventually, half of them will be streaming. Eventually, they will. That's just the, how it's going to work. My final point, back to what you were talking about with markets and ESPN holding everyone hostage. Markets used to be how many people are who, how many people are paying for our product right now that can opt out. 
You know, there's a ton of it's it's an opt out market. If you if you pay for ESPN and you don't watch any games and you realize, hey, we don't pay for this, you're going to opt out. Fan engagement right now is about opting in. How many fans can opt in to watch the school and how many fans are engaged? So if you have a good team and it, it doesn't really matter where the team is, if people are watching, if TCU gets really good, who cares how many people went to their university, how many alumni they have, how many people are wanting to watch TCU football or K-State football or Iowa State football. It's about opting in, and that's what that's probably why a lot of games, you know, K-State, Oklahoma State, those types of games, those football games get put on to ESPN+. Plus. They know that this market is an opt-in market, and that's the best way for ESPN or any other company right now to get fans engaged and to make as much money as they can. What makes this all ultra challenging is unlike TV ratings, the streamers have no, no reason to release their streaming data. Which is weird because Disney is a publicly traded company. Good point. And, and that's really key. I, I think Zach's hit on something. K-State didn't get punished by going streaming, you know, because they're no, not worth it. They know people are streaming. They put started putting KU basketball on there because they knew those people would buy the subscription. So I, I, I don't know where we're going. I'm fascinated by it. Uh, and I do think the in the ideal world, they'll add three out west. For me, it'd be San Diego State and two Pac-12 South institutions. Call it good. Leave Colorado out of the mix. Screw them. They had their chance. They don't really value athletics. I think we're all pretty clear on that. Uh, and then find someone out east eventually. I think for the short term, just add two. Add San Diego State. And if Arizona wants to jump alone, if San Diego State's on board, I think they'd do it. Because they recruit Texas and Southern California along with Arizona. So, yeah, I think San Diego State might get Arizona to come. Crazy times. It, it's crazy times. And as we record this, we are now a good 28 hours into the Brett Yormark era, and I have not seen any signs of world domination. He hasn't built like a Death Star or, you know, or like had a Big 12 trip to the moon. Well, what's he doing? Rome wasn't built in a day, Fitz. Well, it could be online. You know what they say when you're in Rome. <laughs> well, I have spaghetti. Do as the Romans do. Oh, I thought it was like... Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's... pasta. Italy. Hmm. That's it for the PowerCat Questions Podcast. Ryan Gilbert's asleep. I don't blame him. I am awake. Okay. We appreciate you listening. We appreciate The Fridge being our ongoing sponsor. Happy birthday, you old farts. Kevin, you do a great job. And we'll be back next week with another edition of the PowerCat Questions Podcast. Thank you for listening to the PowerCat Podcast. Make sure you're subscribing to our show at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. PowerCat Podcast. All rights reserved. GoPowerCat.com. With Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked. Temperature set. Lost car found. Get complimentary class-leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562-314-4603 for complete details.